These monkeys uh, collect nuts, palm nuts, that are very resistant to cracking, and they take them to an anvil site, which can be a stone or a log, and they carry a stone, or they find a stone at the anvil, and they use the stone to crack the nuts at the anvil. So it's a hammering technology. So it was like living in a dream. We were here to, to find this behavior, but we were not sure that this was really the truth. We are interested in the, the physical aspects of it, how it is these very small monkeys can use such heavy stones. And they, they stand bipedally to do this. The stones are so heavy, they, they, have to, they can't sit and lift them. They have to stand and lift them like a human weightlifter, essentially. Mm. And they lift them to somewhere near head or shoulder height. And then they have to bring them down accurately on the stone, not on their foot. So um, there's, there's skill involved. Only a few species of monkeys uh, to use tools, mainly in captivity. And not only the behavior is common in, in apes. I mean, chimpanzees do a lot of tool use, both in captivity and in the wild. But bonobos, orangutans, gorilla do very little or none. So it's still a very interesting question why tool use is so common in this South American monkey species, the capuchin. And, the, and what is surprising and surprised the entire community is that uh, once upon a time, they were taught to use tools mainly in, in the laboratory, in captivity, or in zoos. And now we know that they are extremely skillful in using tools also in the wild, given the appropriate circumstances. So this is important scientifically. It gives us a new reference point to think about tool use in, uh, in primates in general, and to think about how tool use originated in our human ancestors millions of years ago. Okay. Because it's a feature that's present in a species that's very far away uh, of our lineage. Apes are uh, more close to us. We have a more recent common origin and in, in the capuchin monkeys are very far away. So we can think about different origins. So, uh, the same feature appearing twice in the evolution of primates. And because of that, we can make comparative studies and to model or infer what are con the conditions that were selective pressures for that feature. We, for example, have shown that uh, the capuchins that are for sure not as smart as chimpanzees or are very different, they can do exactly the same things that were considered really special in chimpanzees. But probably there are recipes to do special things, not necessarily with a brain that is as the one of chimpanzees or our early ancestors. When you study a, a biological phenomenon, and this beha behavior is biological, so this is a biological phenomenon, so it occurs in a natural system Natural systems are complex. They can be analyzed at levels from the population and from you know, weather cycles, uh, annual cycles, interannual cycles, right down to the details of behavior over a, a time span of seconds, which is what we do when we analyze kinematics. Actually, we do 30th of a second, so frames of video. So we can look at the individual, we can look at the population, we can look at the region, and it takes the tools of many disciplines to do this. So Adam was um, highly trained in, in image processing and also spatial modeling. So he found some satellite images that was a stereo pair and he was able to do a correlation which creates a, a, a 3D um, view of the landscape. And he also looked at the images and, and classified vegetation and what kind of ground cover and overlaid that on top of the digital elevation model and did some statistical analysis of where the known anvil sites were. Um, his model was, was very accurate. He was withheld some points, checked against the, the predicted points, and some of them were actual anvil sites. And we're hoping um, to go there during this trip and go to some of the predicted sites and try to verify some of his results. The theories that are uh, available in, uh, in our field to go further and explore sex differences in the use of tools, whether the use of tools was really feeling 
a, 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 an energy requirement of the animals, whether really this habitat was so poor in energy that they had to use tools in order to, to survive. And apparently, they do not. So in the end, we think that the animals, instead of the animals, they need to use tools to, to obtain food. In fact, they can use tools. They have time to play with the stones, to explore the environment. So I think this is a, a, something very important that we learned so far. I think that we relied for many things both more on our imagination than on, uh, you know, theories or um, models provided by others uh, researchers. So we did a lot of thinking mm -hmm. in a very naive way sometimes, but we have been successful so far, yeah. so that's nice. <laughs> yeah.